Our reading today comes from the book of Galatians, chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, be with us this day. May my words be your words, and may we take your words and put them into practice, now and always. Amen. Today we celebrate Mother's Day, and I want to read three quotes that I found related to Mother's Day, and I think they are all very poignant. Uh, a suburban mother's role is to deliver children obstet obstetrically once and by car forever after. <laughs> the phrase working mother is redundant. A mother is a person who, seeing there are only four pieces of pie for five people, suddenly remembers that she doesn't like pie. Our mothers serve as an example of hardworking, giving, selfless people, doing what they do out of love. And in today's scripture, St. Paul is telling us how to live for Christ, how to be that same hardworking, giving, selfless person. These verses in Galatians appear amidst a discussion of the grace of Christ. Paul is asserting that the grace of God and following the law are mutually exclusive. If we follow the law, then salvation would be based solely on our own merits. If we follow the law, then we follow the whole law and we are bound to follow every piece of it. If we follow the law, we are obligated by the rules and our lives can become very rigid, very cut and dry. However, says Paul, if we receive God's grace, then we give our sin and we give everything else to God's mercy. If we receive God's grace, then we are bound to faith and to selfless acts of love. If we receive God's grace, there are no limits to our love and our ability to forgive and be forgiven. For Paul, faith does not involve the law. It is dependent on that personal relationship with Christ. In verse 13, Paul declares that as God's children, we are called to freedom. And as soon as he says the words, he, he, he warns them not to use their freedom for self-indulgence. This is, this is confusing. In one breath, he says that we are free and then in the next breath, he warns us not to self-indulge and, and be free to do whatever we want to do. Paul wanted to make sure that God's gift of grace was not a free pass to do whatever one wants to do. God's grace gives us freedom from the law. But that is freedom from our relationship with God so that our relationship with God is not turning out to be a list of obligations to fulfill. God's grace gives us freedom from being manacled to our sin. God's grace gives us freedom to enter into a personal relationship with the living Christ. But God's grace does not give us the freedom to do whatever we want to do. God's grace is not a free pass. God's grace makes us free to live in a way that glorifies God. As Christians, we are obligated to put God first and to help our fellow human beings. Paul also reminds us to love one another. He says to be a slave to our loves for one another. He says the law of God can, become, can be summed up in one sentence, to love thy neighbor as yourself. Now, I wonder what that would look like. How would we live differently if there was but one law, one mandate, one rule to live by? If our lives were motivated solely by love, what would change? Well, I think we would be less critical of each other. I think we would refrain from gossip. We would see 
the good in people, not their faults. We would see the strength in people, not their weaknesses. We would see the success in others, not their failures. If we were motivated solely by love, we would greatly diminish envy and jealousy and pride and competition. We would build up instead of tear down. We would forgive and not hold grudges. We would speak in truth instead of deceit. Things such as rationalization and excuses and selfishness and justifying our behavior would disappear if we could live as God loves us our lives would be amazing. Paul tells the people of Galatia that they are set free. Not free to self-indulge, but free to love one another. Free to follow in the ways of Christ. The best way to do that, the best way to love one another, is to love your neighbor as you do yourself. When we love our neighbor as we do ourselves, it means that we are thinking of someone else besides ourselves. When we don't put ourselves first, then our hearts and minds are more apt to give, to serve, and to think of others. If we don't come first, selfishness and pettiness greatly subside. If we don't come first, we do things God's way, and for God's purposes. Most of us try to live that way for our families, for our children. Most of us do that most of the time. God wants us to live that way for everyone all of the time. And Paul ends this short passage in Galatians by issuing a caution. There is a danger when we do not live our lives in love. We end up devouring one another. If we are treating each other in love, we are giving each other our best. We are seeking out the good in each Yeah, we are seeking out the good in each other. We are celebrating the good that we see in someone else, and we are looking for ways to build people up. When we are not living in love, then it becomes easier to tear someone down, to criticize someone's way of life, to question a person's motives, and to be driven by our own selfish needs. Paul says this will ultimately consume us. And I think that is so true. When, when you're fighting with someone, when you're at odds with someone, when there is tension, when there is awkwardness in that relationship, when, when our negative emotions, when someone pushes our buttons, that those negative feelings take center stage. And it's so draining. It takes up all of our time. It demands all of our focus and attention. It's absolutely exhausting. And it's so unnecessary. The solution is very simple. We are not confined to the law. We have that freedom in Christ. Not freedom to do what we want. Freedom to live for God and to simply love one another. Now I of course have a story for you today. It wouldn't be a sermon of mine if I didn't have my famous or more to my point infamous story. To, to bring forward to you, and, I'm, and this gives me maximum audience effect, if I just come out a, a tiny bit. Uh, this is a Max Locato story, uh, it, it is not mine. And I, I, I picked this story today because it, it tells us, I hope, exactly what we're supposed to do on point today with loving one another and caring for one another and having that freedom to choose to serve God. I, I did also, it is obvious today that it's a story about a mother and a daughter and a story about a mother's love. It's not a Mother's Day story. They happen to be in it. And I hope that you enjoy the story. And I'm, I'm done babbling. I've got the story in my head. I'm ready to go. A Max Lucado story. It's a story that takes place in a little Brazilian town, a, 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 a poor town in Brazil, a town where all the houses look the same with the dirt yards and the red <coughs> tile roofs. It's a story about a lady named Maria and her daughter Christina, who live in one of the <coughs> rows of houses in this town. They live in this house together, just the two of them. They, they have kind of a meager existence. It's really just one big great room. 
They have tried over the years, because they love each other and live together, they have tried over the years to make this house a home, to make it a place of warmth, to give it personality, to give it love. There are orange crates that serve as end tables. There is a wood stove that heats the entire building. But they do their best to make it a home for one another. And they have done that successfully over the years. Maria's husband died when Christina was an infant, and so she was determined that she would love this child, and she was determined that, that this child would be raised in a loving environment, and so she got a, a menial laborer job. It was steady income, steady work. It, it spared no expenses for any kind of luxuries, but with her work and with being able to love her daughter, she was able to provide food and clothing and shelter so that they could live. And now Christina is at the age where she could go out and she could work and she could contribute to the giving of the house. But that's not what this young woman wanted to do. She wanted to leave this town. She wanted to go and see the big city life and be part of what's happening in the real world. Maria tried to dissuade her from this. She said, you know, going to the big city, you wouldn't know anyone there. And you have no education and no formal training. And that big city life that you desire so much would be hard. And it would be cruel. And it would be lonely. And it wouldn't be for you. And she thought she was doing really good, <laughs> dissuading her from going. Until one morning she woke up and she found out that Christina's bed was made and she was gone. And her suitcase was gone, and Maria flew into a panic. She quickly got dressed, she quickly packed as many clothes as she could, grabbed all the money she had in the world, and she ran out the door. Her first stop was to the local drugstore, because in the back of that store, there was one of those photo machine booths. And she went into that booth, and she spent all the money she could afford to spend, and she took as many pictures of herself as she could. And she wrote a note on the back of each picture. And then she headed, headed as fast as she could to get on the bus to take her to the nearest biggest big life city, Rio de Janeiro. And when she gets off the bus, she starts her quest. She goes into every restaurant, every bar, every hotel, every reputable and disreputable place that she can think of. And in every place, she takes her picture and she posts it up. Somewhere on the wall, on the mirror, on, on a banister, anywhere where it was visible, anywhere where everyone could see this picture, she put it up. And she did this every day until she ran out of money. And it was time to go home. And she had no choice. She was forced to go back home. And so that's what she did. It was several weeks later that Maria came down the staircase in a hotel that she was at. She, she wasn't the beautiful girl she once used to be. She used to be a girl where if she wanted to, she could have stayed in that village and she could have married any boy she wanted to and she could have raised a family like normal people tend to do. That she was so incensed with that big city life that she didn't want that. And after a few weeks, you could tell that the big city life had aged her and had changed her. The dream that she went to fulfill, the reality was that she was now living a nightmare. And that morning, she descended the stairs. She saw at the bottom of the stairs a familiar face. She got to the bottom of the stairs, and there on a mirror was a picture of her mother. She didn't know what to do. She was a little, you know, I mean, did I dream this? She, she, she was longing for the chance and the opportunity to go back to that tiny little hut where she was so loved and nurtured, that tiny little shack that seemed like a palace and it seemed like Eden compared to what she'd been living and what she was forced to do. Her mother had put all the pictures up because she knew that her daughter was stubborn. She knew that she'd never come home on her own. Her mother also knew that when hunger and the will to survive clash, that a human being will do unspeakable things to survive. And that's the way Christina was feeling 
as she came down those stairs. But there it was, right in front of her, that picture, that picture of her mother. And she took the picture off of the mirror, and she, she did instinctively what we all would have done. She turned the picture over. And there was the note on the back of the picture. It said, whatever you have done, whatever you have become, it matters not to me. Please come home. Good Mother's Day story, eh? <laughs> every time we do sinful things, every time we do things that make us feel bad and shameful or full of guilt, God's heart and mind goes out to us and God says the same things to us. It doesn't matter what you've done, please come home. And so we can come home every single day to the safety and to the security of this place, of our lives, and of being with God every day. And when we are home, it gives us a wonderful opportunity to choose the freedom of Christ, to love one another, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Let us pray. Gracious God, be with us. Help us to celebrate this day. Help us to appreciate every single one we meet this day and help us to love one another. In your name we pray. Amen.